Volume Two, Chapter Eight of The Antiquary. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Antiquary by Sir Walter Scott, Chapter Eight. For he was one in all their idle sport, and like a monarch ruled their little court. The pliant bow he formed, the flying ball, the bat, the wicket, were his labors all. Crab's Village. Francis Macraw, agreeably to the commands of his master, attended the mendicant, in order to see him fairly out of the estate, without permitting him to have conversation or intercourse with any of the earl's dependents or domestics. But, judiciously considering that the restriction did not extend to himself, who was the person entrusted with the convoy, he used every measure in his power to extort from Eddie the nature of his confidential and secret interview with Lord Glenallan. But Eddie had been in his time accustomed to cross-examination, and easily evaded those of this quondam comrade. "'The secrets of great folk,' said Ochiltree within himself, "'are just like the wild beasts that are shut up in cages. "'Keep them hard and fast sneaked up, and it's all very well or better.' But I ain't let them out. They will turn and rend you. I mind how ill Dugulgan came I for letting loose his tongue about the Major's lady and Captain Bandier. Francis was therefore foiled in his assaults upon the fidelity of the mendicant, and, like an indifferent chess player, became at every unsuccessful movement more liable to the counter checks of his opponent. Say apology had nine particulars to say to my lord, but about your own matters. Ay, and about the wee bits of things I had brought frae abroad, said Eddie. I kenned you popish folk are uncou set on the relics that are fetched frae fard kirks and sae forth. Troth, my lord mun be turned feel out right, said the domestic, and he puts himself into sick a carfuffle for anything you could bring him, Eddie. I doubt na ye may say true in the mind, neighbour, replied the beggar, but maybe he's had some hard play in his younger days, Francis, and that was unsettles folk, sire. Troth, Eddie, and you may say that, and since it's like you'll never come back to the estate, or if ye dee, that you'll no find me there. I is even tell ye he had a heart in his young time, so I wrecked in rent that it's a wonder it has no broken outright long afore this day. Ay, say ye say, said Ochiltree, that mon ha' been about a woman, I reckon. Troth, and ye guessed it, said Francie, just a cousin o' his name, Miss Eveline Neville, as they say I kied her. There was a self in the country about it, but it was hushed up, as, as the grandees were concerned. It's more than twenty years, sign. Ay, it will be three and twenty. Hey, I was in America then, said the mendicant, and knowing the way to hear the country clashes. There was little clash about it, man, replied Macraw. He liked this young lady, and a sort of married her, but his mother find out, and then the dale guide over Jack Webster. At last the pure lass clodded herself o'er the scrawl of the Craig burned foot into the sea, and there was an end on't. An end out with the poor lady, said the mendicant, but as I reckon, nigh end out with the earl. Nigh end out till his life makes an end, answered the Aberdonian. But what for did the old countess forbid the marriage? continued the persevering querist. Fought for. She maybe didn't will ken for fight herself, for she guard a bow to her bidding, right or wrong. But it was ken the young lady was inclined to some of the heresies of the country. Mar by token, she was sib to him, nearer than our church's rule admits of. Sigh the lady was driven to the desperate act, and the earl was never since held his head up like a man. Weird away, replied Ochiltree. It's e'en queer I near heard this tale before. It's ain't queer that ye heard it now, for Dale and I the servants durst have spoken on't, had the old countess been livin. Hoy, man, Eddie, but she was a trimmer. It would have been taken a keely man to I squared with her. 
but she's in her grave and we may lose our tongues a bit fan we meet a friend but fare ye weel eddie i maun be back to the evening service and ye come to envory maybe six months away didn't forget to ask after francie macraw what one kindly pressed the other as firmly promised and the friends having thus parted with every testimony of mutual regard the domestic of lord glenallan took his road back to the seat of his master leaving ochiltree to trace onward his habitual pilgrimage it was a fine summer evening and the world that is the little circle which was all in all to the individual by whom it was trodden lay before eddie ochiltree for the choosing of his night's quarters when he had passed the less hospitable domains of glenallan he had in his option so many places of refuge for the evening that he was nice and even fastidious in the choice ailie sims public was on the roadside about a mile before him but there would be a parcel of young fellows there on the saturday night and that was a bar to civil conversation other good men and good wives as the farmers and their dames are termed in scotland successively presented themselves to his imagination but one was deaf and could not hear him another toothless and could not make him hear a third had a cross temper and a fourth an ill-natured house-dog at monkbarns or knockwinnock he was sure of a favourable and hospitable reception but they lay too distant to be conveniently reached that night i dinna ken how it is said the old man but i'm nicer about my quarters this night than ever i mind having been in my life i think having seen i the rose yonder and finding out i'm maybe happier without them has made me proud of my ain lot but it was it bode me good for pride goeth before destruction at any rate the warst barn ever man lay in would be a pleasanter abode than glenallan house with i the pictures in black velvet and silver bonny walleries belonging to it sal even settle at eins and put in friday sims as the old man descended the hill above the little hamlet to which he was bending his course the setting sun had relieved its inmates from their labour and the young men availing themselves of the fine evening were engaged in the sport of long bowls on a patch of common while the women and elders looked on the shout the laugh the exclamations of winners and losers came in blended chorus up the path which ochiltree was descending and awakened in his recollection the days when he himself had been a keen competitor and frequently victor in games of strength and agility these remembrances seldom fail to excite a sigh even when the evening of life is cheered by brighter prospects than those of our poor mendicant at that time of day was his natural reflection i would have thought just a little about ony old palmer and body that was coming down the edge of kimberley the mont as ony o thy stalwart young childs does even now about old eddie ochiltree he was however presently cheered by finding that more importance was attached to his arrival than his modesty had anticipated a disputed cast had occurred between the bands of players and as the gauger favoured the one party and the schoolmaster the other the matter might be said to be taken up by the higher powers the miller and smith also had espoused different sides and considering the vivacity of two such disputants there was reason to doubt whether the strife might be amicably terminated. But the first person who caught a sight of the mendicant exclaimed, "'Ah, here comes old Eddie, that kens the rules of a country games better than any man that ever drave a bowl, or threw an axle-tree, or putted a stein either. Let's have nae quarrelling callants. We'll stand by old Eddie's judgment.' Eddie was accordingly welcomed and installed as umpire with a general shout of gratulation. With all the modesty of a bishop to whom the mitre is proffered, or of a new speaker called to the chair, the old man declined the high trust and responsibility with which it was proposed to invest him, 
and in requital for his self-denial and humility, had the pleasure of receiving the reiterated assurances of young, old, and middle-aged, that he was simply the best qualified person for the office of arbiter in the high countryside. Thus encouraged, he proceeded gravely to the execution of his duty, and strictly forbidding all aggravating expressions on either side, he heard the smith and gauger on one side, the miller and schoolmaster on the other, as junior and senior counsel. Eddie's mind, however, was fully made up on the subject before the pleading began. Like that of many a judge, who must nevertheless go through all the forms, and endure in its full extent the eloquence and argumentation of the bar. For when all had been said on both sides, and much of it said over oftener than once, our senior, being well and ripely advised, pronounced the moderate and healing judgment, that the disputed cast was a drawn one, and should therefore count to neither party. This judicious decision restored concord to the field of players, they began anew to arrange their match and their bets, with the clamorous mirth usual on such occasions of village sport. And the more eager were already stripping their jackets, and committing them, with their colored handkerchiefs, to the care of wives, sisters, and mistresses. But their mirth was singularly interrupted. On the outside of the group of players began to arise sounds of a description very different from those of sport that sort of suppressed sigh and exclamation with which the first news of calamities received by the hearers began to be heard indistinctly a buzz went about among the women of ay sirs sae young and sae suddenly summoned it then extended itself among the men and silenced the sounds of sportive mirth all understood at once that some disaster had happened in the country and each inquired the cause at his neighbor, who knew as little as the queerest. At length the rumor reached, in a distinct shape, the ears of Eddie Ochiltree, who was in the very center of the assembly. The boat of Mucklebacket, the fisherman, whom we have so often mentioned, had been swamped at sea, and four men had perished. It was affirmed, including Mucklebacket and his son, Rumor had in this, however, as in other cases, gone beyond the truth. The boat had indeed been overset, but Stephen, or as he was called, Steenie Mucklebacket, was the only man who had been drowned. Although the place of his residence and his mode of life removed the young man from the society of the country folks, yet they failed not to pause in their rustic mirth to pay that tribute to sudden calamity which it seldom fails to receive in cases of infrequent occurrence. To Ochiltree in particular, the news came like a knell, the rather that he had so lately engaged this young man's assistance in an affair of sport of mischief, and though neither loss nor injury was designed to the German adept, yet the work was not precisely one in which the latter hours of life ought to be occupied. Misfortunes never come alone. While Ochiltree, pensively leaning upon his staff, added his regrets to those of the hamlet which bewailed the young man's sudden death, and internally blamed himself for the transaction in which he had so lately engaged him, the old man's collar was seized by a peace officer, who displayed his baton in his right hand, and exclaimed, "'In the king's name!' The gauger and schoolmaster united their rhetoric, to prove to the constable and his assistant that he had no right to arrest the king's beadsman as a vagrant. And the mute eloquence of the miller and smith, which was vested in their clenched fists, was prepared to give Highland bail for their arbiter. His blue gown, they said, was his warrant for travelling the country. But his blue gown, answered the officer, is my protection for assault, robbery, and murder, and my warrant is against him for these crimes. Murder, said Eddie, murder. What did I ever murder? Mr. German Dostrasivel, the agent at Glen Withershin's mining works. Murder Dostrasivel, hut, he's living and life like man. Now thanks to you if he be. He had a sire struggle for his life, 
if i would be true he tells and you might answer for it at the bidding of the law the defenders of the mendicant shrunk back at hearing the atrocity of the charges against him but more than one kind hand thrust meat and bread and pence upon eddie to maintain him in the prison to which the officers were about to conduct him thanks to ye god bless ye barns i've gotten out o mony a snare when i was war deservin o deliverance i shall escape like a bird from the fowler plow your play and never mind me i am more grief for the poor lad that's gain than for aught that can do to me accordingly the unresisting prisoner was let off while he mechanically accepted and stored in his wallets the alms which poured in on every hand here he left the hamlet was as deep laden as a government victualler the labor of bearing this accumulating burden was however abridged by the officer procuring a cart and horse to convey the old man to a magistrate in order to his examination and committal the disaster of steenie and the arrest of eddie put a stop to the sports of the village the pensive inhabitants of which began to speculate upon the vicissitudes of human affairs which had so suddenly consigned one of their comrades to the grave and placed their master of the revels in some danger of being hanged the character of dousterswivel being pretty generally known which was in his case equivalent to being pretty generally detested there were many speculations upon the probability of the accusation being malicious but all agreed that if any ochiltree behooved at all events to suffer upon this occasion it was a great pity he had not better merited his fate by killing dousterswivel outright End of chapter eighth